Let's go back to the book of James this afternoon and consider the meekness of wisdom again. So what did we see this morning? We saw what true wisdom does not look like, right? We saw how true wisdom does not behave. And so this afternoon, Lord willing, we want to see what it does look like. We want to uh, understand what we can examine and say, hey, if this is wisdom that I'm participating in, is, is, is that included in uh, the way that I'm dispersing that wisdom? Are these things found in it? And, uh, and I'll be transparent. I've already shared this with some of the brethren. But what brought this message, uh, the, the means that the Lord used to bring this message to me was a situation where uh, someone that I love very dearly shared something with me that uh, to let me understand, to help me understand that there are times that I have shared uh, things that were true, but I didn't have these qualities in there. And so they came across in ways that weren't beneficial like I desired that they would be. And, that, and it broke my heart to think that I would, for someone that I love and care about so much, that those things would not come across in the loving way that I desired that they be. And so um, it, it's, it, this is very personal to me as I'm reading this and I'm going through these things. Like I said, you can, you, you can experience the conviction on your own if you think about particular situations. Um, but it, just in general, I love the list that the Lord provides for us here so that we can examine the things that we, we, say, see, we say and that we do and see if they match up against that which God says is true wisdom from above. So uh, we'll begin in our text again in verse number 13 uh, where we get our title, The Meekness of Wisdom. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. It is from uh, Satan. It is not from God. And we need to recognize it as such. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. So if bitter envy and strife is in our hearts as we speak these things that we suppose are, are words of wisdom, that's not the case then. It's not truly wisdom. It may be knowledge, but it's knowledge apart from love. And I don't want you to lose that. I'm, I'm going to hold on to that. I thank God for saying that to me, that wisdom is knowledge with love. Um, and so verse 17 is where we want to spend our time this afternoon. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Our Father, again, we ask for your mercy now. We pray that we would rightly divide your word of truth, that you would accomplish this, O God, by your Spirit, that you would speak to our hearts, O God, that, you would, that not only would the word of God be opened among us, but that you would open up our hearts to your word, and that we would see and understand and know you better when we leave this place than when we got here. I pray that we would grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that the wisdom of our Lord and Savior would be evident in each of our lives, I pray in Christ's name and for your glory's sake. Amen. So, um, what does true godly wisdom look like? Um, do you want to examine whether or not the things that you're sharing with others is wisdom? Well, here's a nice list that God gives us. Here's some things to consider as we're sharing these things. Whether, whether it's just things that we're considering internally. You know, sometimes the thing that we consider to be wisdom is not necessarily something that we let out. It's just something that we're pondering in our own hearts. Right? We're considering in our own hearts. And so, does it match up against that which is true wisdom? Is, am I considering this thing with bitter envy and strife in my heart? then it's not the wisdom from above, right? Uh, it'll have these qualities that we're about to read through here as we consider those things. So does it fit this description? If it's true wisdom, it will be these things that we have listed out here for us in James chapter 3. So first thing, uh, what is it first of all? How does true wisdom behave? First of all, it is what? Pure. pure. True wisdom is pure. I just had a thought. I want to write this down. Um, true wisdom is pure. And I want to consider that word pure for just a moment. What it means is clean or innocent. 
Those would be synonyms for this word. It is the word chaste that the Apostle Paul uses when he's, when he's writing to um, the Corinthians. And he says, you know, I want to, my desire is to present you to Christ as a chaste virgin. The word chaste, the adjective that he uses there, is our, our adjective pure right here. And look at 1 John 3, which should just be a couple of pages over in your Bible. 1 John 3 and in verse number 3. It is, we find out here the same exact English word, pure, is used here. But look at what this word pure, or who this word pure refers to. Verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We are, we are heading towards that glorious state of being made just like our Lord, and how we long for that. And so if we do long for that, the next verse tells us that we're going to be busy about something. Verse 3 says, And every man that hath this hope in him, what does he do? He purifieth himself. We're not satisfied with what we are, right? I want to begin to look like Jesus Christ now. I'm not waiting uh, to cross over to the other side and then in an instant I'm going to be made just like Him. I want to be conformed to His image right now, right? I want to be growing in, uh, in manifesting Jesus Christ more and more each day. So everybody that truly has this hope in himself, that's what he's doing. He's purifying himself and he's purifying himself how? He is purifying himself even as He that is the Lord is pure. So this word pure here is actually the descri a description of God Himself. Uh, it's the adjective that God uses to describe Himself. And so this wisdom must begin, first of all, it must begin with the pure revelation of Jesus Christ. True wisdom begins with the pure revelation of Jesus Christ that is given to us by the inspired Word of God. It's got to start from this basis. It's got to start from the truth who, that God has declared in His Word and who is the Lord Himself. For He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so when we begin to speculate about things and we begin to step outside the boundary of that which God has set forth in His Word, we are abandoning true wisdom. I remember a man one time saying that um, he was talking about just dealing with others and... and uh, uh, and, and particularly the, the, the particular issue that he was talking about, about was about God being the creator and God having created the world and us just saying God did it in six days instead of caving to the evolutionist that said, oh, this happened over millions and millions of years. And he said, people want to discuss this and they immediately, because they're dealing with a scientific mind, they throw out the Bible and they start approaching them with science. And he was like, what are you doing? The Word of God is, is, our, is our what in the armor? It's our sword. He's like, who engages in a fight and lays down their weapon? Right? That's idiocy. You don't, you don't, no one fights like that. If you're engaged in a real battle, you don't lay your weapon down while the other person gets to keep his. You go at it, both of you, with your weapons. And he said, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Why would we lay aside our sword when we discuss? What we need to give them is the Word of God. He said, you're not going to be able to out-argue them on their scientific arguments. You need to give them the Word of God. Now, if they won't receive it, we just... Brother Gary read it this morning. He said, depart from a fool when you... When you how does it read, Brother Gary? It's one of the Proverbs. When you don't see in him that sense of wisdom or whatever, right? When you get that, that uh, this guy's not receiving this, then fine, I'm not casting my pearls before swine any longer. It's okay. God says it's okay. But if we're going to tell them anything, tell them God's Word. It ought to start true. Wisdom starts here, right? This is the foundation. This is what we need to give people. We don't need to give them our opinion. We need to give them the truth of God's Word. The Gospel of Jesus Christ says it is the power of God unto salvation. And so if you care for souls, give them God's Word. Give them the pure unadulterated, un, right, not, not watered down in any degree, degree. Give them the truth. Give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do not know better than our Creator does. We can't say it any better than He's already said it. 
Give them the word of God. Listen to this. Uh, again, put your, put your mark here, marker here. Um, and listen to the accusation God brings against these prophets in Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23 and verse number 22. I feel sorry for the people that aren't here this afternoon. I, I really do because this is, this is the best stuff. I mean, I was so looking forward to this. Thank you for being here. I pray the Lord will bless it, bless it that God will uh, reward your effort. Jeremiah 23 in verse number uh, 21, he says, I have not <coughs> sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. Jeremiah 23 in verse 22, listen to this. But if they had stood in what? My, My counsel. And had, and had caused my people to hear what? My words. Not their opinion. Not their spin on things. But if they had said what I told them to say. If they had given them my words. Listen to what God said would have happened. Then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Wow. You ever been dealing with someone and you thought... Oh man, this scripture just came to mind, but they don't want to hear that. I know what's going to happen if I give them that. You ever thought that? Maybe these, some of these guys thought that. Maybe they thought, well, if I say that, I know how they're going to react. That's going to make them, make them mad. I better, I better tame this down a little bit, you know, and I'm going, to, I'm going to approach it from this angle here, God, and we're going to kind of leave out these uncomfortable parts over here. Wow, it sounds like preaching in modern-day America, right? We don't want to step on anybody's toes. And God said, if you had given them the truth, that word would have been successful. They would have turned from their wickedness. But you didn't give them my counsel. You didn't give them my words. Remember what Paul said when he left the Ephesians? He said, I have not shunned to declare to you all of the counsel, the full counsel of God. I gave it all to you. There was nothing profitable that I withheld from you. If God gave it to me, I gave it out to you. That's what we need to do. We need to tell men what God said. True wisdom starts from that standpoint. It is founded upon the Word of God. Someone says, don't, don't talk to me about your Bible. Well, then I don't have anything else to say to you, right? I don't believe the Bible. Don't tell me that. I don't have anything else for you but the Word of God. Right. I mean, we, we may approach it like Paul did where he begins the dialogue in Athens there and he says, I behold your statue. But what does he begin to give to them after that? He's giving them the Word of God. He didn't have to tell them, you know, well, if you go back to Jeremiah chapter whatever, but he gave them the Word of God. Because the Word of God resonates in the heart of man because God made us. God's determined that it be, should be so. The heavens declare His glory. Uh, it renders man inexcusable. It, 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 that which is created, uh, we were just reading in Ecclesiastes last night, it says He's put eternity in our hearts. Man has a sense of eternity already, whether he wants to admit it or not. And the Word of God is quick, right? And it's powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword, and it penetrates down into places that our brains can't get to. So start from that standpoint. It is first of all, this true wisdom is first of all pure. The word that God uses to describe Himself. It starts from that basis right there. The revelation of Jesus Christ that is revealed to us through His Word. The second thing that James says, and, and you know, Lord willing, I'll quote this uh, accurately if you don't want to turn back there every time, but the next word is peaceable, right? It is first pure. I had my mark in the wrong spot. Uh, it's first pure, and then secondly, it is peaceable. What about this word peaceable? What does that mean? We'll examine, we need to examine our wisdom and see is it peaceable? This wisdom delights in peace, right? It's the opposite of what we considered with the wisdom that didn't come from above because it was associated with strife, right? You have strife, bitter envy and strife in your hearts. This wisdom is peaceable. It desires peace as it reveals itself. It's a wisdom like that which is, uh, uh, it's like a person, the person that's uh, described in Romans 12 and verse number 18 where uh, the apostle writes, if it be possible as much as lieth in you live what with all men? 
peaceably. Hey, it has a desire for peace, right? It has a desire for things to be made better. We saw it this morning that this knowledge is, is coupled with love. And what does love always do? It edifies. I'm wanting to build up. I'm seeking your betterment, right? It's peaceable. It, it, it desires to live peaceably with all. It's not seeking to incite and use words that are, that are like dynamite, right? That's, that's, that's uh, stirring things up or infuriating, peop or infuriating people. That's not the desire. Uh, brother, um, what's your name, brother? Uh, he, he taught the lesson this morning. He was up here as a guy who's wearing like a, a collared shirt. Gary, that's his name. His name is Gary, and he was up here... And, and he, he talked about the armor of God, you know, and he said, he said, with the armor of God, did you notice it, there's no, there's no uh, instruction there to charge forward, right, into the battle? It was just stand, right? Put on the armor of God and stand that you may be able to stand in the evil day, right? And so there's this, uh, there's this sense of which that we're not, uh, we're not going forth and trying to start a fight is my point with that, right? right? It's peaceable. We're not trying to, to, to upset anybody purposely. My goal is not to, not to make you mad and infuriate me, I, I infuriate you. My, I, I want to do, do good to your soul. I want your, I want your heart to be broken, right? I want them to be cut to the heart like they were on Pentecost. I said, men and brethren, what shall we do? I, I, it's, it's not, I don't want them to be, there was two. One, were, one was pricked in the heart, and those were the ones, is that the word that it used, that they, they took up the stones and they stoned Stephen, and one was cut to the heart, or maybe I got it backwards. But I want the first one, right? I want the Pentecost experience. That's what I desire for you. And so that's the way this wisdom, which is peaceable, that's the way it does. It's, it's, you put on the armor of God, but you're not looking for a fight. I'm not wanting to fight with you. Our, 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 our brothers told us many times, like the word debate. You know, it's like I, people that always want to debate with you over something. Well, so I may enter into a debate with you because you bring something to my attention and you're attacking a particular thing and I'm going to give you evidence in the contrary back. But I'm not seeking to, uh, for an argument with you, right? Live peaceably as much as lieth within you. Live peaceably with all men. James says it earlier in, in, in this same chapter. He recognizes something about this little tiny member, Right? that we have that's called the tongue. It says the things that come out of that little tiny member can do serious damage, right? It can cause a whole lot of trouble. He said it's like this great ship and you got a tiny little helm, you know? You got that one wheel there that's turning that whole big ship. Or it's like one little spark, he says, that, that, can, that, that can destroy an entire forest. Even so, the tongue, he says in verse 5, is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and it setteth on fire the course of nature, and it's, it is set on fire of hell. And so if I'm involved in true wisdom, I'm going to be careful how I use my tongue and try to use it in a way that is promoting peace, right? Instead of gendering strife. That's not my goal. My desire, if it's true wisdom, is to make things better, not to make things worse. It's like a soft answer turneth away wrath. Doesn't mean that soft answer isn't rich and ripe with God's wisdom, right? But how I present that wisdom, true wisdom, is in a way that is peaceable instead of one that is seeking to make things worse. And then the next description is that is it is gentle. Let me show you this word in another passage that you may or may not know is the same thing. Philippians 4. And I think it's important because I quoted this verse to someone one time and then I found out afterwards, ooh, that's not really what that word means. Um, I was talking to someone about uh, exercising self-control and the importance in the Christian walk of moderation. And I said that and immediately this verse came to mind. And self-control is absolutely, that's one of the fruit of the Spirit, right? Self-control is absolutely a part of our Christian walk, and moderation is certainly a part of that. Paul said, I keep my body under, but I quit using this verse to prove that point. 
Because that is not what the word moderation here means. In Philippians 4 and in verse number 5 it says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. It is in fact the word gentle in our text in James. Let your gentleness be known to all men. As far as I can remember, this is the only place in the New Testament, uh, King James, that they translated it moderation. Gentle. Let your gentleness be known unto all men. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. Because the Lord is near. You represent Him and He's nearby. And so let your gentleness be known unto all men. Men. I didn't even have a note in my Bible. I want to make a note of that real quick. So let your gentleness be known to all men. One thing it says here that everybody ought to know about you as a follower of Jesus Christ is your gentleness. They ought to recognize you as a gentle person. The Lord says it. Let all men know that. Everybody ought to see that. Now, moderation, that fits well with other religions. There are many examples of self-denial and minimal living among the religious cults, right? You think about monk-type living, right? I, I still remember this episode. I think I've told you guys about it, and it's too gross. I'm not going to repeat it. But how, you know, these monks lived, I, I don't know if they were, I think they were Hindu, but it was like the way that they denied themselves. And, um, and then some of the things they did do was disgusting. But it, it was very minimal in the way that they lived. There was, there was much moderation in the way that they lived, but... The Lord says He would have us known by gentleness. And I thought that fits well with our title, the meekness of wisdom. That your gentleness would be known by all men. Self-denial self is something that can totally happen in solitude, right? I can be a monk living in a monastery somewhere, separated from the rest of the world, and be practicing self-denial. But you know what? I'm going to have to interact with other people if I show gentleness. I mean, it, the, the, the word in itself, it, 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 it requires, there's an object I've got to bestow this gentleness on, right? Yeah. I mean, I may be interacting with animals, but I've got to be gentle. I mean, there's, it takes another object to say, oh, that person's gentle. You have to see how they interact with others. It's observed and it's exercised as we relate to others. And so this wisdom seeks to benefit others in gentleness. That's how it deals with others. Not, and not bulldozing over people and belittling them, Right? Not showing how much smarter I am than you are, but gently expressing, gently revealing that knowledge that God has given. The word is used twice by the Apostle Paul, and I'll show you the two places. 1 Timothy chapter 3 is translated differently here too, but it's our same word. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And here it's, it's used as um, a qualification for elders or bishops or pastors. We've been through that before. It's the same, the same office that he's talking about here. And so one of the things he says that is expected among those that are uh, fit for this role is that they are gentle. Um, it's in verse number 3. Uh, this is the office of a bishop, right? And not, he is not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient. That word patient there is our word gentle. He is gentle, not a brawler, not covetousness. Uh, not covetous. And, uh, and then also if you flip over to Titus, so there it's an instruction to the one that is in this office of a pastor. Here, it is told to be that which Titus is just to teach the church. Verse, uh, chapter 3 and verse number 1, "...put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle." But gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. You see the meekness of wisdom there? This is a necessary quality as we share the wisdom of God. 
If we want this word to be effectual as we share it to others, we've got to share it in gentleness. We've got to uh, have this quality of gentleness as we deal with others. And I think that goes very well with the next point in James's list here. The next thing he says is, so it is pure, this wisdom is peaceable, this wisdom is gentle, this wisdom is easy to be entreated. Easy to be entreated. That we're, the word means compliant. It doesn't mean that we cave on what's true. Right? It doesn't mean that we water things down and we, we don't stand our ground on what is true. But it does mean that this wisdom is ready to hear. It's, it's as ready to listen to you as it is to speak to you. And doesn't James say that somewhere else? You guys remember that in James chapter 1 and in verse number 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to what? Hear. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, easy to be entreated. The word that comes to my mind when I think about this and in conjunction with the gentleness that we previously considered is this is an individual that is approachable. Right? You can approach them. They're ready to listen. They're not, they're not well, I know what's best, and so let me tell you how it is. They're ready to less, listen and hear your side of the story. They're, they're, they're ready to consider where you are and put themselves in your shoes. You'll find an ear that understands your circumstances, right? And, and hasn't made a decision before you ever even open your mouth. Easy to be entreated. This wisdom can even hear words that disagree with it. And still not, not flame up in anger, right? Or stop and think... Oh, I see what you're saying there. Yeah, I was, I was a little off in my way of thinking there. That's the way that this wisdom behaves. Let me ask you a question. Who couldn't come to Jesus? If they needed healing, if they came to Jesus and said, Lord, heal me, show me. Take me to one passage where He denied them, right? Where He turned them away and He didn't grant them their request. Was he easy to be entreated? Yes, he was. I mean, we, you can take me to an instance where, you know, the Syrophoenician woman comes to him and, and he seems to have this sense of being disinterested in her. But that wasn't his point with that. He's about to show the world what great faith looks like, right? And, and so that's the one that comes to him and first of all, he pretends that he doesn't. He acts like he doesn't hear her. Right? He's just talking to his disciples as if he didn't hear. And then the second time, he says, I'm only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then he says, it's not fit to give the children's bed bread to the dogs. But did he give her her request? Yes, yes he did. Matthew 12, 15, we won't go there for time's sake, but it says the whole multitudes came out to him and it says he healed them all. Multitudes! Our Lord was approachable, right? No one feared coming to Him. I'm going to hear, I'm, I'm, a, I'm coming to someone that I understand cares about me, right? Easy to be entreated. He, he, he wants to identify with me. He, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He's been touched with the feelings of our infirmities, right? The only people that, that left Jesus and weren't healed were the ones that refused to come, right? But if they came, He had mercy upon them. And they left free from their infirmity. And that's our next point. This wisdom is full of mercy. Full of mercy. Think about that. I, I, that's what I want. That's what I'm hoping we will do as we go through all of these things. Think about how we interact with others as we disperse this knowledge that we have and we seek to give people the truth. Is this what's in our heart? Is it a heart full of mercy? Is it a, it, 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 are, are we gentle? Or is it peaceable? Is it easy to be entreated? Is it, ba is it based on, is it pure? Is it based on the pure Word of God? Full of mercy. Compassionate and consider it being able to put yourselves in uh, yourself in others shoes look at hebrews 13 hebrews chapter 13 
It's getting mighty quiet in here. We need some sounding brass or, or a clanging cymbal, right? Just, just enough to jar us and then we can get back to the clarity of things, right? To stir us up. Someone needs to go check on Brother Mike, the amount of sweets he put down. Go make sure that he's still on his feet back there. So, full of mercy, in other words, compassionate and considerate, being able to identify with others, think, consider uh, what they're like in their circumstances and deal with them in that fashion. Listen to Hebrews 13 and verse number 3. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. I'm not physically in the jail cell, right? But I'm remembering them as one that is. I'm, I'm, I'm identifying with them. I'm considering what it must be like for them to be there in that situation. It's like praying for our pastor, considering what it must be like to be so overwhelmed with pain you can't even concentrate. Praying for one another, entering into that suffering with them and praying in that manner. Remembering them in that manner. Uh, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Experiencing the same adversity, right? Considering that. It's like Brother Gene, you know, sent out the email for the man at the church up there in Milton that got hit while he was riding his lawnmower. He's lost his leg. He said he was always very active. You know, it's, you think it's devastating, yeah, that he lost his leg and you pray for him, but I'm, I'm going to also pray for him in a unique way because I know how active his lifestyle was before and how, you know, there's going to be the temptation for this to just be really depressing and devastating to him because he's not able to do those things that he was so used to doing before. Praying for people with that in mind. Entering into their difficulty with them. Putting yourselves in their shoes, in their place. Philippians chapter 3. That's the way this, be, this wisdom behaves. Philippians chapter 3. Not, well, you ought to do this, right? It's the Sabbath day. You shouldn't pick the corn. These guys are hungry. Or pick the wheat as it was. Philippians 3 and verse number 3. Uh, that's not it. 2 and verse number 3. Philippians 2 and verse number 3. Beach 2 at that time, Brother Gary. Fulfill. Well, that's verse 2. Now let's back up to verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, that goes well with full of mercy, right? If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and what? Mercy. Mercies. This wisdom is full of mercy. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife, right? That's the wisdom that doesn't come from above. Or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. It's not all about me, right? I'm thinking about you. I'm putting myself in your shoes. I'm thinking about what your experience must be like. That's the way this wisdom behaves. Not looking only on my things, but also on the things of others. Conscious of what they're going through. What's that? One, two, three, four, five, number six. Full of mercy and also full of good Fruits. And I told you we would come back here to this passage, Galatians 5 and verse 22. That's the same word fruit right here where it says, when it says full of good fruits, it's the same word, uh, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. We saw things associated with wisdom that is from beneath in the previous verses, but this one, this verse 22 expresses the things that are associated with the wisdom that is from above. The fruit of the Spirit is love, knowledge with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such there is no law. And so this wisdom is full of good fruits. Full of good fruits. It's... um. And I just want to point out that, that, that this wisdom, uh, this full of good fruits, this is often associated with, uh, we often associate wisdom only with the wisdom of words. A lot of times when we think about wisdom, we just think about someone saying stuff and teaching people, right? But this, this portion here that says this wisdom is full of good fruits shows us that it's not just about what we say, but it's also about 
what we do. True wisdom has works as well. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I think we were in this chapter this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that um, I, I didn't come to you in verse number 1 with excellency of, of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. What, what wisdom are you talking about, Paul? Well, let, let's read on down a little bit further. For, uh, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Yeah, but you said you didn't come to them uh, in excellency of speech or wisdom. Are you saying you weren't coming declaring wisdom to them? No, but my speech and my preaching, he says in verse 4, was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. That's what I didn't come to you in. I, I didn't come to you like that wisdom that is from beneath that we considered this morning. Because the wisdom that's from beneath comes only in words, but there's not any action to back it up. And he said, my preaching was not like that among you. It wasn't just lofty, enticing words of man's wisdom that everybody could be impressed with because I said words like conundrum. Somebody told me what that meant and I've already forgotten it's a difficult, I think it's like an impossible situation. I'm glad God is the God of, that, that things that are impossible with us are not impossible with Him. But it, I didn't come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in what? But in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, right? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul said, I didn't just say I did. These things were demonstrated. They were shown to you as the word means. Demonstrated here means to show, not just to speak. And so it's like James labors concerning faith, right? Faith without what is dead? Works. works. It's no faith at all if there's no works to back it up. It's full of good fruits. There is a lifestyle that goes along with it. And, and that's actually what we read this morning. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? It says in James 3.13, Let him show out of the good conversation or manner of life his works with meekness of wisdom. This wisdom is accompanied with good Fruits. There are works that back it up. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Almost done. So that was one, two, three, four, five, six. Now number seven. This wisdom is without partiality. It is without partiality. Brother Gary read to us this morning, James chapter 2, where they were... He was getting on to them for being partial, right? He said, you're making a difference. Someone comes in in goodly apparel, you treat him differently than the poor man that comes in in vile raiment, verse 2. And, and so he tells them in verse 1, do not have the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ with respect of persons. Don't treat one differently than the other. He said, when you do that, in verse number 4, are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? So we are called to not be partial. This wisdom is without partiality. It is not biased. This wisdom can serve a Pharisee and it can also serve a publican. Jesus' ministry extended to Jews. It extended to Gentiles. It extended to Samaritans. He ministered to them all. We just mentioned the Syrophoenician woman. We know the amount of times that he, that he spent among the Jews, but he's also there with the Samaritans. It was the Samaritan village that the, 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 that the disciples said, hey, should we call down fire from heaven because they didn't receive Him, but Jesus was there ministering to them. He was declaring the Word of God. He was participating in revealing wisdom to them as He was among them. He was 
dispersing knowledge in love. And that's what he rebuked the disciples of. You don't know what spirit you're of. That's not my spirit. The Son of Man's come to save, right? Not to destroy. So it is without partiality. It's not biased. Jesus ministered to all. In so much that He amazed His disciples at times. You remember that in John chapter 4? In John chapter 4, they come up at, on Him and He's sitting here beside a well talking to a woman that is a Samaritan. And there's only one group the, the Jews hated more than the Gentiles. It was the Samaritans. It was this mixed breed, right? The only thing worse than being not a Jew outside of that is to be partially a Jew and you're mixed in with all that other stuff with the Gentile world. And so here he is talking to a Samaritan, this Samaritan woman, and it said when they came up on him, uh, uh, verse 27, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. I can't believe he even acknowledged she was there, right? Much less enter in the dialogue with her. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? He ministered without partiality. Paul said, I made all things to all men that I might by, uh, by all means save some. And so uh, look at Ephesians 3. Look at his instruction here at how this lack of partiality was not just supposed to be something that the apostle was living because he was an apostle, but it's extended to the entire church here. Look at Ephesians 3, and in verse number 8, he says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. See, I was sent to the Gentiles. And he was the perfect apostle for that because he saw himself as the chief of sinners. He's like, I can minister to anyone because I see how bad I am. Beloved, that's how we ought to be able to minister to others, right? That's why we ought to be able to minister without partiality. Because we realize how bad we are apart from Jesus Christ. And to make all men, how many men? All men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church. What? The manifold wisdom of God. According to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so here I am ministering to Gentiles and also saying that I have a heavy burden for my brethren according to the flesh, the Jews. And I desire them all to be saved. He says, Church, you have a calling to manifest, to declare, to make known the manifold wisdom of God. And you do that without partiality. Jesus said, Go into all the world. Without partiality, without bias. And then finally, number eight, not my list, the Lord's list. He says that true wisdom, it is pure, it is peaceable, it is gentle, it is easy to be entreated, it is full of mercy and good fruits, it is without partiality, and it is without hypocrisy. It is without hypocrisy. Look at Romans 12. Romans chapter 12. It is without hypocrisy. In Romans 12, in verse number 9, it says, Let love be without what? Dissimulation. That is our word. Without dissimulation is the same Greek word without hypocrisy. It means sincerely. Let love be since done sincerely. Let it be done without hypocrisy. Not putting on a show, right? Not doing that because I know that's what's expected, but sincerely from the heart. When we put on a show, that's... Being a hypocrite, right? That's what a hypocrite is, a stage actor. He puts on a show. He's being looked at and so he's going to, I'm going to act the part because this is what's expected right now, but not doing it sincerely from the heart. True wisdom is expressed without hypocrisy. 
It's expressed sincerely. The care is real, right? It's knowledge with love. The love, like it is here, is without hypocrisy. It's real. It is sincere. To be without hypocrisy is to present things to others. As you speak these things, you're also judging yourself. Right? That's how we... That's how we tell the truth and we do it without hypocrisy if as we speak the truth, we're judging ourselves as well. How often has the truth of God's Word been hindered because people say and they do not? What did Jesus say about the Pharisees? He said, listen to what they say. I'm telling you guys to do that because I know you're having a hard time. You know why? Because they say and they do not. Don't do what they do. But listen to what they say. They got knowledge in their mouths, but they're living lives that are contrary to that. They're hypocrites. And it hinders the Word of God. You can't hear from someone. What do we think? We think, how dare they tell me how to fix this problem that they're saying I have in my life when they're doing this? They're guilty of the same thing, right? It's hypocrisy. You can't receive anything from somebody like that. True wisdom is delivered without hypocrisy. They're judging themselves. I got to come up here and I got to preach this word to you as one that sees. I told you, I'm reading this passage and I'm convicted over it, right? I'm not in some high, lofty position and I'm getting all this right. You know, just ask my family, you know? I need to, I'm teaching it and learning it and walking in it and wrestling with it myself. Do it without hypocrisy. We need help with the splinters in our eyes, don't we? But you want somebody that's pulled that beam out of theirs, right? So that they can see clearly to help you out. The hypocrites still got that beam as they're walking around. Listen to Galatians 6.1. What's the type of individual that can restore men that are overtaken in a fault? In Galatians 6, 1, it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. There's our word, the meekness of wisdom. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. In other words, he's spiritual, which is what we, the way we saw heavenly wisdom works. It's not carnal, it's spiritual. He's spiritual, and he's, he's coming alongside this individual to help them up uh, in their fault. He's doing so in meekness, all of those things, the gentleness that we talked about, the uh, easily, uh, being easily entreated that we talked about are there. And he's also considering himself because he recognizes, he's not a hypocrite and thinks that somehow he's far above this. He recognizes, I am what I am by the grace of God. And he's considering himself, lest he also be tempted. He's helping without hypocrisy. That's the way that true wisdom works. And so now you see why our description, our title fits, right? When you go through all eight of these things, when you call it the meekness of wisdom, that's exactly what it is, right? That's exactly who the Lord is. We see Jesus Christ in each of these things. He's our example. Our brother said it this morning. He's our pattern in all of these things. This is the way He lived. He is our wisdom. And so let's, let's read our last verse in James and we'll close. Let's examine what we think to be wisdom in our lives by what we read in verse 17. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, it's gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. The Lord said it'll be like planting peace. You can't go down to Walmart and buy that. They don't have little seed bags full of peace, you know, go disperse this out. But that's what He said it is. It's like dispersing the seed of peace. We're planting peace and guess if you plant peace, guess what's going to come forth? Peace! Right? It's the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. These individuals are peacemakers. They're peacemakers. This wisdom brings peace to men's 
So if it will benefit them eternally, I mean, it will benefit them eternally if heeded. And that's what we desire. Even in Christ, even being in Jesus Christ, I can be guilty of sharing knowledge in an unwise way. Knowledge with love. Knowledge with love. That's the way wisdom works. And so I want to encourage you today as we disband. If you've heard this message and you say, mm, yeah, so-and-so really needs to hear that. I'm glad that they were sitting here to hear that. Then you missed it. You ought to go back and get the recordings and listen. go online and listen to it again. Because I'm talking about you. And I'm talking about me. Because we all need to hear this. We're all part of this group. Is, our, is the knowledge that we share, do we have envy and strife in our hearts when we share it? The brothers, we were talking about it afterwards. You know, how often does something come to our mind? And before we've ever like fully analyzed what's going on here, we're spewing it out of our mouths and what's really at the root of that is, huh, he thought that was good. That he, what he said, wait till he hears what I've got to say. I was at the center of that. I didn't care about the people I was saying that to. I didn't just disperse knowledge with love. That was all about me. That wisdom didn't come from above. And I might have been quoting Scripture with what I said, right? The wisdom from above looks like this. We must examine our own hearts to find, to look for these characteristics of true wisdom if we desire men to have peace, peace for their souls because that true wisdom will direct them to the one who is our wisdom. And by the way, Jesus Christ is also said to be our peace. He is also our peace. We are sowing, it's like sowing peace by them that make peace. You know, James has a lot to say about wisdom, and I guess it, it would be fitting for me to close with this final thought. If any of you lack wisdom, James 1.5, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Amen.